um, you know, one of the things we thought would be interesting for you all is if nonprofit work was right for you. And Heidi, do you want to start with that? Sure. Uh, just out of curiosity, are there is there anyone on the call? I know we just had a snafu, so we probably don't want to do the hand the hand thing again. But I just I'm so curious to know: or is there anyone out there who is in for profit and is looking to transition to not for profit? Can we get a show of hands? Okay, so we've got one student, and so I'm, I'm going to assume that everyone else is already in the nonprofit space. I just want to make sure we know our audience. Okay, um, if anyone wants to pop in and say we missed a question, that's okay too. So many moons ago, I graduated from college and went into the for-profit space, and um, five years into it, I was making more money than all my friends. I was working constantly, but I was very, very unhappy, and so... Um, my actual employer said, you know, why don't you go work for one of our pro bono clients? They have an opening. And the opening was for a human resources uh, development professional seat. And so I went, had a five hour interview with this nonprofit executive, um, five hours, that's right, five hours, because it was such a robust conversation. There was this feeling, I don't know how to describe it, but there was this feeling that I was in the right place. And that began my nonprofit career. Now, I only did that job for eight months because while I was managing all of the human resources for this nonprofit, I started uh, taking on the responsibility of fundraising. It was very, very intuitive for me, very natural for me to go, that, go in that direction. And the reason I share that with you is nonprofit space, unlike a lot of other, um, a lot, well, I wouldn't say unlike for profit, but certainly is distinct in that if you want to try out different things within their organization, it's typical that you can. Um, anyway, so I went to my executive director and I said, I need new business cards. Here's my business card form. Please sign it for me. And he's thinking he's signing a form that says Heidi Webb, director of human resources. And as he looked at the piece of paper, it said Heidi Webb, director of development. And he sat back and he said, you know, no one's ever asked for a job that way for me before, but um, it's yours. It's all yours. So I've been in fundraising ever since then. And when I was way back when, uh, there really wasn't a fundraising track in, in college or at any of these wonderful institutions that are represented here today in the panel. So I, um, you know, had to figure it out and go sign up with the Association for Fundraising Professionals. I went and, you know, did my research and got my certifications uh, as I needed them. Took every seminar, went to every conference I possibly could. So hats off to all of you for being here. And I hope that you diversify what it is that you want to learn today. So you can learn a little bit about every facet of nonprofit. And I've gone off on such a tangent, Lisa, I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> Do you want to ask that question again or say that I answered the question? Well, the one thing that we uh, want everybody to understand is before you jump into nonprofit world, what are the pros and cons of working? Oh, in sure. Oh, and, sure. Um, that's where we were going with that question. I uh, see. Well, I mentioned one, and that is that you can really, um, you know, get your feet wet in nonprofit. And, and in preparation for this, I took a few notes. I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, so let me start out with, um, I mentioned that pro. There are some cons. Uh, I think they're important to note. Um, bureaucracy. Uh, nonprofits are governed by a board of directors. And so when you want something done, it, it doesn't just go up to the executive director. Oftentimes, depending on the nature of the change you want to see or the permission that you want to get, it actually has to then funnel up to the board. Some nonprofit boards meet every month. Uh, most meet every other month or quarterly. And very few, um, I'm sad to report, maybe meet annually, which isn't ideal for nonprofits. But um, in doing that, that can take a while for decisions to get made. So you, it really tests your patience. Um, there's lower pay. Limited resources, I think every nonprofit I've ever worked with, even in my consulting role, has said we can only make certain copies and we can only they can only be in black and white. And I know we have a color printer, but it costs four cents. I mean, it's really, does anyone have a pen? We're not buying new pens. We're gonna survey all the offices and see how many pens we have. Um, every dollar is 
accounted for. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but the pressure of feeling like you can't spend or you can't, you know, we talk about teachers oftentimes having to buy their own supplies. And I've worked with a number of colleagues in the field who, who also have had to, you know, purchase their own supplies. But to that note, they're accountable to donors. And so I think it's good stewardship to be very, very thoughtful about where you're spending your resources. Um, the ability to wear many hats, I'm, I'm, I'm switching gears here into the positive. The, the ability to wear many hats allows you to skill develop um, while you're getting paid. And so I think that is a huge advantage in the nonprofit sector is that really you can move around. Um, there's less stepping on toes in that way because everyone is all hands on deck. Um, there aren't, a, another good one is there are, while there's usually, not always, but usually less, less pay in the nonprofit sector, um, they usually make up for it in benefits. And I'm speaking of, you know, health insurance and things to that effect, but I'm also talking about being able to telecommute before we all sort of had to, um, being able to, um, you know, go home and be with your children who get off the bus at three o'clock. Um, being able to um, have a number of holidays when I was, it's been a while, but when I was in the not-for-profit space as a W-2, as an employee, I think I had 11 holidays every year. I had ridiculous amounts of vacation. Uh, they know that they're working you to the bone um, in a good way, I guess. Um, they know that they're working you hard, but they also, um, most nonprofits will balance that out and make sure that you have time to regenerate and recuperate. Um, I can go on and on. I think Kathy, um, you're chomping at the bit to say a few things as well. I love this space. So I wanna say all positive things, but certainly there are some things to consider um, so that you don't enter into the space and, and not know what you're getting into. Well, thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I mean, Heidi, you really covered so much there. And um, I, I uh, really kind of maybe will just reiterate a couple of the points um, that you made there. Um, I also love this space. I actually work at a nonprofit. The University of Michigan is a nonprofit organization itself. And so as Heidi was talking about, you know, um, working in this space, and we might talk about it a little bit later in our session, there's such a variety of types of nonprofit organizations that you can choose to, to work in or be, you know, be a social entrepreneur and create one of your own. And so, um, you know, I think depending on, you know, you can, the selection of the different types that of focus, the different sizes, the different um, geographical areas you can work with is so broad in this space. So you could work for a nonprofit like the NCAA, uh, which is massive um, and has billions of dollars um, at its disposal through different um, ways that they generate revenue. Um, or you could work for a local community um, Little League nonprofit. Um, and so I think, you know, the gamut of types of nonprofits um, is so wide and so broad. But I do think, you know, as Heidi mentioned, there's a few um, consistent um, themes in terms of the pros and cons of working for each type for, for a nonprofit organization. And certainly some of the Pros are, you know, um, and one of the reasons I work at a nonprofit and I research this space is um, that there's so much potential for social positive social change and positive social impact. And so if that's something that you care deeply about and that you value, um, you can commit your not only, you know, um, uh, talent, um, uh, you can commit your expertise and knowledge to trying to help um, make the world a better place through sport in our case. Um, and as Lisa said, I think there's a lot of opportunity maybe for flexibility and innovation and entrepreneurship that maybe isn't as, you know, um, is a little bit different in, in terms of what it would be like in, in the corporate sector. And I think there's a real deep connection with the communities um, as, and, and the beneficiaries of the um, focus of the programs or the grants that are made um, in nonprofits. 
on the the challenges side, I don't know if I would call them cons, but the challenges certainly as um, you know, Heidi mentioned as sort of the, the governance of, of these organizations and um, uh, the decision-making um, influence that certain bodies, uh, boards of directors have. Um, managing volunteers is also, which is a big part of nonprofit organizations can also be um, a challenge and you have to sort of understand what are their motives and why do they, why are they doing it and how to incentivize continued participation. Um, and certainly, uh, I think, you know, in all nonprofits, accessing resources is a huge challenge um, and something that, you know, in my classes, we talk a lot about um, developing skills in this space, not only as fundraisers, like um, in terms of um, gift giving, but also through grant making and being able to solicit or uh, secure grant uh, grants through requests for proposals or, or things like that. So those are just some of my initial thoughts. Good. Well, I think uh, they, those are all great. What I try to encourage my students to do is think, why do I want to get into nonprofits? Um, it could be simply to build up skill sets that then I transfer to other um, entities. So working with American Heart Association, running um, their races, you know, organizing their fund runs or organizing their events gives you that event management skill set that then you can transfer into um, working for a professional sports team or working with a nonprofit that has a close relationship to athletes uh, and teams could give you those connections to move over. Now, or you may truly want to sleep well at night. By working with a nonprofit, you know, or you are doing something valuable and not just making money for billionaires, which some of my students have moved from working for professional sports teams to working for nonprofits because they're like, I bust my butt. Don't get paid a lot for working for a professional sports team. I might as well work for something that I care about and is doing good for the world. So you need to kind of decide what is it and why are you looking at the nonprofit space to get into in, in the first place. And it's fine if it's a stepping stone. Um, I always say nonprofits is like a minor league baseball team or a minor league team where you, you could be called to do anything and everything um, because it's usually a small staff and one minute you're out doing programming, throwing balls, working with kids. And next you're talking to some, you know, high-end client trying to get some or a high-end possible donor. Um, you know, larger, more nonprofits have it divided. There's a team that are fundraising and development. There's a team for events. There's a team for programming. There's a team for m measurement and evaluation. But anyway, um, you know, if you're jumping into a small nonprofit, just know you're going to be called to do various um, activities. And that kind of gets us into you know, what are the different types of places you can work and then the different skill sets that you need. So we're going to keep bouncing back and forth. Um, Kathy, you want to start on this one? Sure. Um, you know, it's funny. One of the first things I do is I teach an undergraduate class in, in the sport management program. And most of our students want to end up working a professional sport team or um, a corporate sponsor. And so in my class, one of the, you know, First things I ask my students to do is, you know, what what are some sport nonprofits you know? And so um, they kind of can tell me a few. Um, but uh, the the as I said earlier, um, the range of of sport or organizations in the nonprofit space is huge. And so you could, you know, work for an uh, an organization like the um, NCAA or intercollegiate athletic departments. Um, which are, are nonprofit, um, sometimes independent affiliates of or of uh, institutions, university institutions, national sport governing bodies um, overseen by USOC, which is uh, the uh, United States um, Olympic Committee, um, and so national governing bodies like University U.S. Track and Field Association or figure skating or basketball are, are um, another subsector of the nonprofit um, world. Um, team foundations are um, also 
nonprofits, um, separate entities to the team, oftentimes. Um, athlete foundations, as, as Lisa mentioned, um, are another space of um, nonprofit organizations. So, you know, um, organizations like the LeBron James Family Foundation or J.J. Watt Foundation, uh, Kobe Bryant Foundation, for example. Um, so um, I, those are some that, um, you know, I kind of point out to my students as opportunities if they're you know, seeking um, to further explore their, you know, the potential for employment or participation in the nonprofit space. And I'll know, I know Heidi has a few more to add, so I didn't say them all. <laughs> Go ahead, Heidi. Well, I mean, I, I do have Green Kite Fundraising. I'm a consultant firm now, and I never thought I would be because I, I used to be very anti-consultant, and here I am one. But um, I'd like to think I'm a little different. So if you're in, if, if fundraising appeals to you or even human resources or law, there are firms that specialize in working in the nonprofit sector um, that will employ you at different nonprofits, which keeps it kind of exciting if you're not sure. For example, I love, you know, if you love football, um, there are organizations that partner with uh, the NFL to do special events that are, par you know, partnered with charities. So um, I think consulting firms are great in that way. Uh, you mentioned colleges and universities uh, working, of course, they have to raise a lot of money for those sports uh, arenas and, and, and all of the equipment. And, and, and if you love sports, for example, I know a lot of people here do. Um, that's a, a great place to be. And I have to share a funny story with you two ladies. Years ago, I, I signed up for a conference all about fundraising. It was a three-day conference on site in West Virginia. And I knew that I wasn't in college or university fundraising, but I wanted to see what the other half lived like because I, you know, I'd always been grassroots nonprofit, foster care, international causes, local causes, national causes, but usually, you know, frontline stuff. And it was nice to see that they had a place for pens and pencils and they could take copies without um, too much of a, of a hassle. It was very funny. But um, you had mentioned, I think already, Kathy, you know, a lot of celebrities and athletes have smaller uh, nonprofits that they, um, you know, they typically em begin to employ others outside of their, you know, inner circle. And then there's also corporate social responsibility. If you're, if you like working with nonprofits, but you're not ready to be, nor do you want to, to be on an, a C3 payroll, then consider uh, working for a, a corporate organization um, that has a corporate social responsibility arm. So they're very coveted jobs. They're hard to get because it's usually a one or two person role. But how cool is that to work for, you know, Microsoft and be in charge of their, you know, corporate social responsibility division? That would be, you know, a pretty cool space to be, to be in. Google, you know, there are a number of organizations and they don't all have to be these, you know, top organizations. There's an accounting firm in DC, for example, that has a corporate social responsibility um, arm. Financial institutions, law firms, um, some of them employ a corporate social responsibility person as well. Um, check with your associations in areas that really appeal to you, whether it's sports, healthcare. Um, again, I mentioned uh, if you're an expert in a space like human resources or accounting, there are you know, great associations. It's a different type of nonprofit, but it's still nonprofit work. And I'd like to add, if you have interest in international work, there's many, the United Nations, <clears throat> they have, um, right, there's UNICEF, there's various um, United Nations branches that work in the sports field. Uh, there's Right to Play, there's, um, I mean, also the PGA Tour is a nonprofit, but there's, uh, you know, just do searches for, you know, nonprofits with a little plus sign, sports and international, if you're interested in international. Um, there's a resource, sportanddev.org, which um, lists a whole bunch of organizations and job opportunities there. Uh, going back to college and universities, it's not just about raising money, most colleges and universities at the division one 
now has at least one person that's handling all their outreach, their community um, outreach. And those, um, those are opportunities. Uh, right now, I'm a little worried about those positions because they're usually just some former student that ended up getting that position and not well-trained. Um, so we're trying to make a pitch to you know, NCAA to make sure that the people in those positions um, are making the best use of the athlete's time and, and being a good partner in the community. But there, and then after school programs, you know, there's the Boys and Girls Club, there's Special Olympics International. Each Special Olympics International does world games, but they also have chapters around the world in all these different cities and states. So start there if you want to, you know, um, be with a larger organization, opportunities to move around internationally, nationally. Um, so there's Disabled Sports USA. There's a lot of disabled sports organizations. There's so many organizations in sports with um, a nonprofit bent and you know doing great things. Uh, I can go on and on. Some good ones. Yeah. <laughs> so what are those skill sets that are required to work in this field? Heidi? Uh, you know, I think the biggest one, the most important one, and, and I don't think it's a skill set necessarily, but it's important to reiterate, Kathy said it earlier, and then uh, you've certainly mentioned it as well, Lisa, is this just desire to help, uh, desire to be a part of something bigger than yourself. And so I think that's really important. And I'm not necessarily referring to altruism and, you know, um, sort of pointing in one direction. I think just uh, you have to be motivated in that way because otherwise the, authentically it begins to appear and you begin to be unhappy in your in your job if that if that's not as important to you as just you know getting the job or getting whatever ever salary they're offering. Um, here's the really great thing and again I, I you know I wish we were engaging in a different way in a classroom setting or something. So I knew your exact interests, but you know, if you're, if you're even split in your decision and you, you, for example, um, manage uh, your local, you know, PTA outing or PT work for the PTA, then you know how to raise funds and you certainly probably are engaged in events as well. So there's special events. If you, um, our human resources director, uh, a lot of those larger nonprofits in particular that Lisa mentioned have volunteer coordinators who get to be in charge of a thousand volunteers. Hospitals, for example, we haven't mentioned hospitals yet, uh, but hospitals have wonderful um, nonprofit uh, departments and, and they work with volunteers. And if you're a people person and, and good at project management, then those are right up your alley. And then of course, you know, the nonprofits need just like everybody else for profits. We, you know, we need lawyers, we need, you know, human resource specialists, we need people who are really good at administration as well. But definitely uh, you know, the ability to be flexible with what your your job role is, because I think more than any other industry, all hands on deck is is just commonplace among regardless of the nonprofit size, everyone chips in. I worked for a college and they had this huge department and, you know, but when there was an event, even if it was a small one, small meaning, you know, six figures or less in terms of their overall goal, uh, everybody was in. It didn't matter if you were the grant writer. It didn't matter if you were the administrative person. So definitely a team player doesn't mean you can't work independently, but um, definitely have some some uh, ability to work with a team. Just, just to add to a few things um, to what Heidi said, um, you know, I think um, from my own experience and working with students and working with community nonprofit organizations um, here in the um, Ann Arbor, Southeast Michigan um, area, um, a few things I sort of seen that um, can be very beneficial skills in nonprofit organizations include specifically being a very good communicator, being able to tell a story about, you know, the value of the work that the organization's doing, 
And that's really important in a number of ways um, in terms of not only communicating to stakeholders what your organization's all about, it's really important for grant writing and to secure resources. Um, I've seen a lot of, one of the things we do in, in my class is we have this experiential philanthropy project where students, we have $10,000 to give to a local nonprofit. We solicit grants from um, smaller sport nonprofits in the area and just looking at the variety of the grants that and how they're written, um, you know, it's a it's a skill that can be very can be developed and really, you know, to be able to tell that story is really a, a, a valuable skill. Um, so for grant writing and also for being persuasive in terms of fundraising and you know soliciting donations, direct donations, as as Heidi mentioned, and then another sort of skill or ability I think that's really important is being a being analytical and being able to assess and you know um, understand what does impact what impact looks like so how do you measure it how do you evaluate you know the impact that your organization's having and I think those are two of the right really important skills um, that are necessary for you know nonprofits, along with what Heidi mentioned, of course, as well. Can I add one, Lisa and, and Kathy? There is one. I just noticed uh, one of my colleagues is, is on the line. Hi, Jennifer. Um, but social media, uh, we, we, you know, when I grew up, I still had, you know, a beeper. And, you know, I've gone from the beeper to the smartphone. And, you know, trying to keep up with social media, I noticed, I've noticed that more and more nonprofits uh, have the desire and the need for people who are you know, good at it, specialize in it, and as Kathy said, can, you know, equate uh, your, the results of your social media outreach to real solid numbers and fundraising. There's a nonprofit I work with, um, hats off to them, they realized they needed a social media expert. She now brings in $30,000 a year just via their Facebook. That's a whole position. So I don't know if there's anyone on the on the line here besides Jennifer who who's really really loves social media, but that's another skill set that seems to be quite on demand, at least in the grassroots nonprofit space. And I'd like to add that I think of nonprofits as any other business for profit, and I think that's the way um, everybody should look at them. Uh, there are you know marketers, accountants, lawyers, um, HR. Uh, development people, people who put on the programs, the social media people, and, you know, some nonprofits outsource the, you know, some parts of that uh, to, we talked about firms, you know, they have their own lawyer, they may have their own accountant, some do it internal, some are part of an umbrella organization that does it for them. So there is just no one set structure, but when you go into a bit a nonprofit, people should think about it. And if you're ever thinking about starting a nonprofit, you need to run it like a business because in the end, you are there to be efficient and effective to get the best um, benefits and impact to those you're serving. And if you're just running it like crazily, uh, you usually don't have a big impact or you make one big impact and then it may not be lasting. So think about the sustainability of your nonprofit and run it like a business. So that's my uh, perspective. And then finally, you know, there was a lot of talk about fundraising. I can tell you if you are a good fundraiser um, and don't think about it as, oh my God, I'm always knocking on people's doors. It's strategy, it's corporate sponsorship, it's fundraising, but you really have to understand what, uh, what attracts people? What are people interested? Why would they give? Um, so it's a lot of sociology, you know, psychology, sociology, uh, business. Um, and so, and you will always have a job and you'll always make good money in fundraising. But not everybody's into fundraising. Uh, program development, just know that's satisfact, you know, that's the satisfaction part of things. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop because I feel like we've been chatting quite a bit and I'd love to hear any of your questions, any additional comments. We have different, we have more things to say, but I want to open it up. 
Anybody? No, anybody out there has a question, comment? Lisa, just to fill some, some debt, some airspace here while people are thinking of their amazing questions they're gonna stump us with. Uh -huh. um, I, this is on, I think this track is under skill development, yes? Yes. Okay, so I think reading is a great way to build your skills too. So I have two book recommendations. I didn't write either of them. I don't get, you know. Anyway, um, one of my favorites, Forces for Good. If you haven't read it, uh, get it, at, check it out from the library. I know it's probably backwards on the camera, but um, it's a really phenomenal read. It's very, very inspiring. A bit technical at times, but it's um, it, it gives you. It takes six nonprofits, very high impact nonprofits, and it 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 kind of breaks it down for you. What made them a force for good? I love it. I quote it all the time. And then another one. Again, I'm not sure how many of you are in the for-profit space or in a different space and looking to get into a uh, nonprofit space, but another one, uh, it's called Switch. And it's not a nonprofit book like Forces for Good, but um, it's how to change things when change is hard. And so um, maybe that's just what you, someone needed to hear that book. I'm not sure why I grabbed it as much as I liked it. Um, and this is a skill devel development track, but it's it, it definitely is a good read if you're looking for change. Um, yes, Ebony, I cannot see those questions. Roy, do you have I access? See chat, do you want me to? Oh, it's not there. Yeah. Are there questions on chat? Uh, it see. says there are two, but there's not, we, I can only see, like Lisa, I can only see the one. Hmm. I don't even see one. Hmm. No, I don't see any. Can any? Can we? Can people unmute if or raise their hand if they will have a question? I have a question. Ebony, go ahead. Hi, y'all. This Jessica. is Jessica Gagnon. Um, so I'm currently. I'm gonna. I'm currently a graduate student in VCU, so for the sports leadership program here. And I came back to school. This is my fourth degree because I do want to take part in social change through sports. So my goal is to create a mentorship program for student athletes um, to help them in different ways, but to also create new leaders. So my question mostly is for Miss Kathy. That transition into you know, sports and being a nonprofit in the university level where, where although it's a nonprofit, sports are so business-like. What, what would you say, you know, what skill sets would I have to utilize or even the mindset going into such a nonprofit organization dealing with athletes that are treated like professional athletes? How, how do I navigate through that? Mm, that's that's a great question. And I think it speaks to some of the points that Lisa and Heidi also made about, you know, understanding that, you know, nonprofits operate like a business. But the, you know, the difference between a for profit and a nonprofit is that the um, the the revenues get reinvested into back into the organization for nonprofits to continue development rather than given being given to shareholders. So, but um, in terms of collegiate um, sport and trying to get a foothold there in the space and and um, to you know um, support development of athletes, for example, in your case. Um, I think a lot of it is, of course, um, having a good network is one um, important facet of this. And so connecting with people and, and not being shy and speaking, you know, sharing your ideas with with a bunch of people. And if one person is not the right one that, that can help you, you know, get your path, uh, it could, they could lead you to another person who might be the right one. I think another thing is really for your own um, objective and what your interests are, really being able to explain what the problem is and how you think it can be solved. And so, and how that would best fit in with, let's say, an athletic department in what area. You know, I know athletic departments nowadays, um, 
are really changing their, their focus, um, not only in terms of, as Lisa mentioned, connecting with community, um, local communities, but also in terms of recognizing the support and development of their own athletes from a number of different perspectives, from mental health, um, all the way to, you know, leadership development. So really explaining and, and being able to articulate and persuade someone for the need for such a, you know, an idea um, to be implemented or program to be implemented would be a really, you know, important thing for you to, to start working on developing. Thank you so much. And Jessica, I'm not sure how much experience you have working with a mentorship program, um, but for all of you, I, you know, many people come to me and says, well, I want to start a nonprofit. Uh, I'm going to work with this athlete or I see more opportunities for mentoring. I really believe it's the same thing that I tell my students who want to be an entrepreneur. I said, it's hard to start something <clears throat> if you have not worked in a business and have some idea of how things run. So the best suggestion is, and there's a, trust me, any idea you have in nonprofits, there's something out there that's already happening in this area. So the best idea is for you to go and work with an organization that's mentoring work with, you know, um, uh, athletic department, work with somebody to see how the inner working, how it works. And then how, what is missing in that program? What can you then offer and do differently? But for you to sit on the outside and say, that's not working without you ever being in it, it's, it's doesn't work that way. So I highly encourage you to go work with an organization that's doing something similar to what you would like to do so you can better understand all the facets that's involved. Thank you. I'm currently a GA for the women's basketball team here. So I'm, I'm seeing directly the student athlete experience and I was a former student athlete. But I think actually going into a mentoring organization, even volunteering could yeah, help. Volunteering, you know, the first thing that you can do is I'm sure your students are having to do some service work, right? You can start by doing a simple interview with your students saying, do you think this service work is valuable to you? How could it be more impactful for both you and maybe the organization? I mean, I've been singing this idea for a long you know, many time, years now is that I think student athletes should not just be going out and throwing a ball back and forth with kids just to check off their service engagement requirements but you're all studying something maybe you're studying sociology maybe you're studying marketing maybe you're studying accounting they should be working on those skill sets because at the end of four years I hear it all the time oh I never had time to you know practice my what I studied I never had time for internship well you had time to go out and throw a ball why don't those nonprofits give the student athletes like hey can you look at this you know these numbers can you help me develop my website can you help me do some social media posts have student athletes actually do something that will develop their skill sets in what they're studying Thank you. Thank you for that. Other questions? You know, Lisa, that brings up a good point worth um, driving home is volunteering with nonprofits, regardless of the type of nonprofit, they all have volunteer opportunities, is really a great way to get your feet wet and develop your skill set, as we mentioned earlier, as if you were employed. I'll tell you, I've lost count over the years of how many volunteers that I have personally hired to uh, be an employee of the organization I was working with because they were so phenomenal. I, I even think in a couple of cases, we created roles for them because it was just such a great you know, relationship that we were able to bring them into, into the fold and find the resources to you know, afford to pay them. So not saying that you get into volunteerism for that reason to get a job, but uh, I'm saying you, you can. You can volunteer to get the experience at the very least. And if there, it's an organization that you love, whether it's the American Cancer Society or 
um, UNICEF or, or what have you, it, it could be an entree into a future employment with that organization. Thank you. If, if anybody can, if anybody put a question in some chat box that we don't have access to, <laughs> could you please go ahead and share with us your question. Okay. I think we actually go go off at in a couple of minutes anyway, so we can maybe do some final thoughts, Lisa, or, sure. or did you have something else that you wanted to cover? Well, the other question was, it, when you do apply or think about which kind of nonprofit organization, what are some questions you should ask? And so, I have a question. excuse me? I have a question. Sorry, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Ebony, hi. Can you see me? No, but we can oh. hear you. <laughs> Go ahead and ask your question, Ebony. There she okay. is. Hi, sorry, I'm on like five different laptops. <laughs> um, so I know Dr. Lisa, I'm actually a student in her uh, sports philanthropy program. Oh. Um, my question is actually for um, Kathy, because I'm also a Michigander. And yay. I, yay, and I used to work at Eastern Michigan, so your little brother's school. <laughs> So my question is, um, I'm in sports philanthropy full time, finally, for the PGA Tour stop here in Metro Detroit. And I want to get back into teaching within the sports philanthropy sector. I used to teach international social work classes and nonprofit development classes. So my question to you and everyone else that can answer is, how do I position myself back into the higher ed realm in my new career, but still work in my full time job? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wow, that's that's amazing that you're you're um, you're doing what you're doing and working. Um, are you here in in Michigan now? I am. I am. Okay. I'm in Michigan, actually. Okay, great, great. Um, so we, you know, I, I can only speak from from the University of Michigan and how we do it. Maybe um, Lisa can speak um, what what happens at, at her institution. You know, I think certainly reaching out and letting people know is one thing because we, you know, if we have a space or we have a slot that needs um, an instructor, um, what we would generally try to do is, you know, look at our own you know, community or network to see if we could fill that. Um, so like making, making it known, I think that you are interested or have an interest in this um in 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 teaching um, and education is sort of the first step. Um, we, you know, and I also would say for you, thinking more broadly, you know, we have a sport management program here, and I know Eastern has one um, as well. Um, so there could be courses that you could teach as a lecturer or as an adjunct um, as a possibility. Um, and then, you know, that could sort of be able to fit into your current, you know, full time working schedule. Um, it, you know, you might have to move, move, shift a few things around depending on what time the courses meet. Um, but or then, you know, we've had people come into our program um, who are working, you know, for the Detroit Tigers full time. And then they just decided to you know, shift and we were looking for a lecturer, full-time lecturer. So now this person teaches, I think, eight courses or something like that for us over, you know, the, the, the different semesters. And so he really did a full, like a, a 180 in terms of career shift in from, from the professional sport industry into education. So, but now that I know that that's an interest of yours, maybe we can chat and, um, uh, follow up after this session. Yes, I would love that. Thank you. There's also junior colleges, community colleges that yeah. um, are open to such curriculum. You can just present that to um, different, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a sports management program. It could be a sociology program. You already yeah. have sociology. Um, it could be a, a nonprofit program. So, um, you know, really we have social work or public health are other areas um, that I know teach teach courses in this space. So thank you. Um, good. Any other questions? Um, we can go back to kind of a, a summary, but 
you know, some things to look for when you're looking for positions is, you know, is it a good fit for you? Do you want to be with a larger nonprofit or a smaller one? Um, again, smaller ones, you're going to wear many hats. Larger ones, it's going to be a little bit more, you know, established. Um, um, Heidi and Kathy, do you want to add some additional thoughts before we're kicked out here? One one thing I'll just add really quickly because he, Heidi mentioned um, the, her two resources, her books, which I wrote down. I'm going to go check those out. Um, a really important resource that I use all the time for my research and for my students is um, a website. It used to be called GuideStar, and now it's called Candid, and it combines guides. That now Candid combines GuideStar with Foundation Center. But if you're looking for, um, you know, to work at any nonprofit, you can go and look at their history of, you know, their, their financial history, their, um, it gives you all kinds of information about who's on the board of directors, their governance, um, even some contact information sometimes. So I always find that is a amazing resource. Um, for any, it's got every nonprofit in the United States. And so that would be a, my go-to resource that I would recommend you to check out. Yes. And I, I wholeheartedly agree. I don't work with nonprofits until I've reviewed their 990s. Uh, 990s are financial forms that they're required to complete. Um, and uh, it's it just those numbers and those relationships uh, tell a story. And so, you know, I think I think you want to look at their budget. I think you want to look at, and that tells you a lot about um, what's available to them. If if if, uh, if if in meeting them, you've you know walked away with this perception that they've you know they've got this huge staff and they're you know all over the country, and then you look and see that their operating budget is a hundred thousand dollars. Well, there's a conflict there. Um, not to say that they weren't just excited about their mission and sharing with you very positively. Um, it's not to call anyone out, but I think it's you doing you doing your homework and really making sure it is in fact a fit. And I'd like to close by saying, if you really do care about the impact, I've been asked to serve on boards and I go look and see what percent of their revenue actually goes to the cause. And it's amazing how some people have very little of what their operating budget is that goes to their cause. And I think um, I don't want to be associated with an ineffective um, or inefficient uh, nonprofit. Uh, I want to be with one that is making the most use of every dollar that's out there. So the, the Forbes magazine, Lisa, every, um, it, knowing that that matters to you, the Forbes magazine every year comes out, end of the year, December, January, um, comes out with the top nonprofits and it, they give you pie charts on percentage that goes to program, et cetera, et cetera. And they tell you why they selected those nonprofits. So they're, they span the country to be able to produce this annual uh, report. Okay. So there's lots of sources out there, Chronicle of Philanthropy, um, you know, as Heidi said earlier, you've got to read. If you want to be in this industry, stay on top of things. Charity Channel, um, sportandev.org. There's many different resources out there for you. So if you're serious about it, um, you know, read up, uh, stay connected, connect with people, and get experience. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Well, great to see you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for enjoy help. the rest of the conference. Thank you. You. Thank you. Feel free to reach out to any of us if you yeah. have further questions. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for moderating, Lisa. Great Thank job. You. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Heidi's already left. Bye, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? I'll stay on for a little bit if you do. Could you repeat those resources you just named off again, Dr. Asa? Sure. Uh -huh. There's um, well, Chronicle of Philanthropy. There's um, the Charity Channel. 
here's sport and dev so sport and dev dot org uh, we already mentioned candid so those are a few of the the ones that are the most popular or best sources i should say and for fundraising, there's the uh, executive of fundraisers. I think that's the name of it. Um, there's an association of fundraising and they are really good. Um, I think there's actually an association of philanthropic fundraising or something like that. So I would recommend looking at that association if you wanna go into the fundraising side of things. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Okay. Well, I think I'm going to close the session now and hope to see some of you later. I'm doing a sponsorship session and a women's session later. Thank you. Bye.